today we're going to talk about something that you certainly have never heard before. Um, but at the same time, this is what we're going to do is we're going to extrapolate. We're going to take uh, the teachings of St. Teresa of Avila and um, St. Hildegard von Bingen, and we're going to p- apply it as an example to uh, a way we can think of the choirs of angels in terms of our spiritual life, the way the angels work in us, and also just a raw path that we have to take to uh, get to God. And I think this is really um, good and important information, and this is going to form a representation of a three-dimensional figure, like a sphere, um, with the first three choirs being the core, the second three choirs being the second dimension, and finally the third three choirs being the third dimension. So let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful, grant that by that same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. So um, the way that we're going to do this is it's gonna, we're going to talk about the nine choirs of angels, and we're going to break them up into three parts, and then we're going to talk about the first tier, the first three choirs, being the, um, the the core of the spiritual life. Basically, this is how you become, this is what you can do to serve God. It's all you can do, in a sense. And that these three angelic choirs, if you if you translate them, and this is just a, a way of thinking about the spiritual life. I'm not saying it's a, you know, based on anything, um, you, you know, specific. It's just this is a way you can... You can, based on the saints, um, you know their their concepts. Anyway, I'm I'm applying the, those same concepts to the to the uh, the angelic choirs, and with these ideas, you can become holy and you can become perfect. And this is this these are the steps you can do. Of course, it's up to God in the end, but this is how you can relate to God in a way that will start a relationship with Him. So the first dimension is going to be the first three choirs, seraphim, cherubim, and thrones. And the way that we want to think about this is that um, they're concentric. The idea is that in the in the middle, the path to God, the first thing you can do has to do with the seraphim. And the seraphim, it's really kind of interesting. Um, the seraphim have to do with self, um, uh, basically self-trial, self-mastery, and, and um, repression, repentance is kind of the idea behind the word, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then after that, it's praise of God, and it, in the end, it, beca- it, it beca- that's how you identify with God. And it's I put the word confuse on the bottom, which is kind of a confusing word, I guess. But ultimately, the idea is that there's only one identity in the divine life, in your relationship with God, and that's God's identity. So we have to be overcome by God's identity. And the way that we do that is first test ourselves, purge ourselves, Repent and then praise God and do acts of charity first towards God and then towards men and these two steps basically the 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 subjugation or the control of the self and the and the praise and service to God and man is how we um, change our identity to be what what we're destined to be by God and basically um, and it's through this this last step here that we um, become holy. So the word seraph in Hebrew, the word seraph is, is, is the burning one, right? And it's the first step is this acceptance of God's call um, and the path to recognizing that, that, um, that, that we are called to a relationship with God. And then it's, it's an embrace of humility. This is the idea that we're, we're basically saying we are small. It kind of hurts to be humble. You have to say, I am. I need to de- decrease and God needs to increase. I need to not have and God needs to have. I have to wake up early because I need to worship God. I need to, uh, in a group of friends, make myself the fool by talking about God when nobody else will because God needs to be first in my life. And so that's the identity of this, this, first, this, uh, this first sphere, the seraphim. And then the cherubim, interesting thing because these are, I just talked about the Hebrew word, 
um, for the seraphim um, was is um, the burning one, right, or burning serpent. Well, the cherubim, the Hebrew is de- is derived from the the root karev, right? It, it's karev, and it's derived from the the root karev, which means to bless or to favor. And so it's um, you know this say, there's a saying that people say, you should keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. They'll often this will be part of like like mom movies and things like that. But this basic idea of keeping your enemies closer, right, is the idea that you take that which is burning, that destructive element, that which is hard, and bring that first. In other words, service to God and to man is first. That's the first thing that you bring, you bring closest to you. Secondarily, you need support. You need to be to be praised, and you also need to praise God. The first thing you do in service is give entirely of yourself to God. Secondarily, then, you worship. Worship is after you first give yourself. It's first an acceptance of the call and a humbling of yourself. Once you do those two things, then you begin the life of um, praise uh, to God. And finally, I've got this picture here of this man um, who looks like a rugged ascetic, right? Like somebody from the Bible, maybe. But he's sitting on a throne that's a wheel, right? One of the reason why I chose this imagery is because um, this, and he's a king. The reason why I chose this Im- imagery is because the choir that we're talking about here, this third choir, we call in the Catholic um, in the Catholic tradition, we'll call it thrones, right? And so, you go, of course, you got a king sitting on a throne, and it gives the idea of it. But it's taken from Ezekiel, and the, and the, and and um, there's these burning spheres that um, that that are the, sorry these these burning wheels that are, that are the seat underneath the throne of God on which God his throne is seated and so you get and so we call it thrones in the Catholic tradition they're called ophanim in the in if you talk about this choir of angels in the in the Hebrew tradition or the Judaic tradition they're called ophanim and they'll sometimes be called galgalim both of those terms talking about wheels um, and so I have I have the wheel here and this wheel has a lot of symbolic meaning in um, in some other traditions and uh uh, um, and and uh, and also, if you think about the idea of a throne, what is a throne, right? It's an identity of a king, right? So it has this same kind of idea, though. Even though the wheel, the wheel is that you can't get through the king without serving him, right? And so what that means is you got to decrease and he's got to increase. And so first you subjugate yourself in terms of the seraph, and then you praise God. So first you say, I I choose to serve you, God. I choose to go through a fast, for example, fasting, right? Repent and believe in the gospel. You choose first to repent, then you give assent of your will and love of love to God, and that's the cherubim. And then finally, through those through those two things, then you approach the throne, which is where you have to give into the identity of God. Right? God's identity must reign. And this wheel is the idea that that if you don't do it, you cannot pass. Right? So then you go to the bottom of the wheel. The idea is like a cycle. Right? You go to the bottom of the wheel if you can't do it. And then, but if you, but that's the door. The doorway is through the kingship, through that crown on the top. You have to go through the crown of the king, the true king in heaven, in order to pass. And so, in a sense, I said it's three-dimensional life. This is it, right? That's the whole thing right here. And now the next three are going to be the whole thing again. But this is our basic relationship with God. So in terms of the first dimension, this is the heart of the spiritual life, and that is self-control, self-denial, praise of God, which then brings about identity and um, losing of the self to God's reign, right? Those three are the full life of the Christian. But now we're going to go into the second layer. So if you imagine in terms of, terms of dimensions, this is going to be like two-dimensional, right? And it includes the do- dominationem, potestatem, and virtutem, or in English, the, do- the dominations or the dominions, the powers, and the virtues, and as I said, this is now two-dimensional. Before, we showed a line when we showed our first graphic, right? And um, But now we're talking about a two-dimensional um, structure, which is li- which would be more like looking at a picture on a page, right? That's what two dimensions means. It's kind of like looking at both height, or, um, not depth, but height and uh, height and width, right? But not depth. And um, so this 
these the second dimension is tip, is is demonstrated in the in the dominions the powers and the virtues and this is the active dimension so again the first is the identity dimension right i like i renounce myself like this is my my sentiment my identity what how i how i identify i renounce myself before god and i praise god these are basic choices you make these are like on off switches right you just say i turn on i turn on renouncing self and praising God and through that I try to turn on the identity of God and not my own identity right yes 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 that's what I try to do and, and you'll never I mean that path is your whole life the idea of making God fully identi- his full identity be in you and not you is sainthood I mean that's perfection and so that, but that's your goal your goal is to try to turn God on and turn you off right but the second um, sphere now is talking about how this manifests in life this is the active sphere right and so the first sphere, dominions, and this is the way it's described by the first Christians that um, interpreted uh, the book of Colossians um, to, to, uh, to talk about what the meaning of the dominions were. And that is that they, you're bringing the reign of God, um, you're bringing the reign of, reign of God down to earth. You're basically trying to make heaven's reign come to earth and reign on earth, Right. And so the, the process is, this is, again, an active sense. It's similar to what I already talked about in terms of that fire, uh, uh, the, fire the, the flaming ones or, or controlling yourself and purging yourself. Um, that first one is, is self-control and bringing God's law to earth. And that's going to that's gonna require things like, self, like um, overcoming your passions, giving up, um, submitting to God's will, and um, trying to identify with the paths of God. And in so doing, when you start acting that way, what's going to happen, and this is you, when you experience the spiritual life, and this also this is also a reflection of uh, St. Teresa Avila's The Interior Castle. She talks about the first three um, rooms being basically um, the entrance into the spiritual life. And in the first the first room or the first the first castle, I guess you'd say the first the first castle. Um, you're going to have the first castles or the first the first mansions. You're going to have um, you're going to have people who are not in control of themselves. They're not practicing self denial. But when they start to right, when they start to recognize that they're in sin and they need to they need to repent and they need to overcome their flesh and they need to praise God. They start to pray. Sometimes they start to over start to do a bit of self denial. When they do that, then the devil will attack. And so this is, you'll see these people, the people who are at the second stage in terms of the active spiritual life, you'll see them as, um, as, as under, they'll seem like they're under a curse often, and you'll also see them with a lot of turmoil. They'll seem half insane, I would say. Um, and so um, because often they're going to be people who are trying to lose their own identity and, 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 and live for God. And so they're going to be kind of, they're going to be, becoming strange they're going to be they're going to be struggling they're going to be uh, often struggling with things like um, obesity or or uh, jobs etc because the devil will be coming at them it will be they'll get much deeper temptations towards sin and all they have to do is just give up and say i don't follow god and once they do that then they will they'll exit that path but when you start to dominate or take part in this the, the dominions and dominate your flesh the power or the, the the devil will come attack you and this is where you need through prayer and continued repentance you need the help of the angelic powers right to help to defeat those devils that are coming your way so basically you've gone from self-subjugation and bringing the reign of god to earth to spiritual warfare and this is what the powers represent is spiritual warfare in your life and so um in th- through this path of spiritual warfare just for this so i used this imagery of dominions of a it's i tried to do um a, a mesh between a human and uh and a, a chrysalis or like a like a, a worm entering its cocoon, right? You've got the idea that there's a there's a, a person, but they're getting wrapped up into a cocoon, right? This is where you are um, controlling yourself. You're getting a thick outer shell. You're um you're you're taking control of all that. All where you were in service to the world and to the devil. Now you're starting to live with your service towards God, and you can see this by covering and wrapping, right? But then secondarily, as you're getting wrapped in your cocoon, you see the attack of Satan through the fire that's surrounding. You see this dark sky, and you see the fire starting to um, envelop 
the cocoon, right? And this is that battle under the powers where you have the angels fighting for you and the devils attacking to destroy you as you're trying to bring the reign of God to earth and you're getting involved now in things like spiritual questions, spiritual dialogues, evangelization. You're talking to people about the faith. And this is what it, this is where you are basically putting yourself into the fray, into the battle where the powers are taking place. And now finally... Um, what what if once once you are you by the grace of God you're 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 letting heaven reign on earth and to a sufficient extent you've rejected sin and you're overcoming the battles that you're in um, with the help of heaven of course only with the help of God um, through again there's only one thing you can do right and that's that first stage and that is that is um, that is repentance of your sins and giving of your life to God, basically letting yourself become small, going through that fire of the seraphim and praising God. So you're doing those two things ultimately, and then they will result in victory in this sphere of the powers. And that's not a, a, ter- a permanent victory, but this is a, a beginning of a victory. And what happens then is God starts to, um, this is from St. Hildegard von Bingen. She says, this is, she says this same thing. So I talked about St. Teresa of Avila saying it. Well, St. Hildegard says the same thing, and that is that the virtues um, are the result of self-renunciation, recognizing God as your ultimate everything, right? And then doing good and praising him and doing charity. You can do those things. You can, you can admit your humility before God, pursue him and praise him. And in those steps, that beginning foundation, then he begins to, to um, infuse virtue into you. As you continue to work and continue this process, as you continue to renounce, you continue to give up yourself and make him large in your life, then he starts to give you these virtues and infuse them into you like lights into your soul. And that's the goal here, right? And you can see now the chrysalis, right, where this is, a, this is imagery from St. Teresa of Avila's um, interior castle. This chrysalis now is growing into a butterfly. And you can see the, the wings expanding, something like wings anyway, expanding out from what was a cocoon, right? And this, and you can see brighter skies coming. And the idea is that you're starting to emerge and you're starting to be able to fly. And that's that's the whole path again of action. So we talked already about the path of identity. That is, we choose to subjugate ourselves. We choose to go through trial. We choose to make ourselves humble before God. That's the seraphim. Then we praise God. We turn our attention to him and his kingdom and his will. By those two things, we lose our identity to God's identity. We want to let ourselves lessen and God become larger. That's all we can do. But as we, as we keep that sentiment, that forms actions. And those actions put us into the fray of the battle. As we do- dominate ourselves, the devils attack. And as the devils attack, then we fight back and the angels help us fight. And then we, we go through this, these paths of the dominions, through the powers in, the, in, um, in that that as the battle wages and then the the virtues start to give birth and the virtues are going to be things like honesty right they're going to be thing all the all the thing good things you can think of honesty fortitude you know um endurance magnanimity so magnanimity big heartedness like where you you know you're going to be strengthened in these things charity right you're going to be strengthened in your charity and your kindness and your long suffering and your sacrifices etc mortifications and so finally, now we're on the outside. So we talked about, so far, two dimensions, right? That first dimension is all you can do, right? That's all you can do. All you can do is, is say, not me, God, right? And the way that you do that is you say, is you say, I'm willing to suffer. I'm willing to go through loss. I'm willing to, be, to, to, to do the work, I should say, to serve God. And I'm willing to praise God. You do those two things, that changes your identity. That's all you can do, is let your identity change to unite itself with God. And then... By doing those things, then your active life, the warfare of the spiritual life, those other three stages you see manifest. And as those are happening, now as you're manifesting, you have this third, you know, you're now at a three-dimensional figure, right? Now you're starting to go from two dimensions to a three-dimensional figure. And in this three-dimensional figure, we have three um, angelic choirs that signify it, right? The first is principalities. And this is kind of this is an interesting thing because what we're ha- what we have here is the this is the the identif- this is now the the manifest is what I want to call it and I know that maybe doesn't translate very well but that which is a, a visible that which is outward that which is social that which is communi- uh, communitive you know you're in a community and you're and you're interacting with people well the 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 most outward of those um, of those 
of those um, choirs, right? Those, the most outward of those, the beginning, in a sense, of your spiritual life is the principalities. And they represent things like you you start to obey laws, right? So, like, the, the, the idea of the principalities is the idea of the, the whole collection of man, the um, cities, towns, um, and states, countries, they're going to have principalities over them. Right? These kinds of angels are over the, those states. And so the idea of us identifying and doing the work with the principalities is that, is that we, are, um, we are making ourselves right with that sphere of life. And it's interesting because what it means to make yourself right is first you become exemplary in the public sphere. And that is that you follow laws. You don't break laws. You become hardworking. You become a good part of society. You, you, you have integrity. You build your community. And people smile upon you, right? But as the Christian, and this is where this is the, the beautiful thing, is it's a terrible thing in a sense and a beautiful thing, but this is this is the, the walk that we talked about, This the, the, the insanity making and the hard part of the spiritual life is that you have to go further than that. So you have to be so good to your community that you say things nobody wants to hear. To the whole community. You have to be so good in your community that you do things that think people think you don't need to do or shouldn't be doing. But they're but they are things that are in service to God. And so in a sense, like Christ, you have to step beyond so you can see in a sense, it's kinda interesting in Christ's life, you see this this is the Romans, right? The Romans represent the domination of the physical state of Jerusalem, right? And the domination of the Roman Empire. They represent the domination of the of um, the principalities, those who are reigning over his region, right? And he has to go become first exemplar and holy where he's not, a, he's not trying to fight. He's not trying to rebel. He's not causing problems. He's not stealing. He's like a perfect citizen. But then he has to go beyond it, right, to where he's talking about the kingdom of heaven and a better society. And he's going, in a sense, they're now, start, now starting to notice, wait, you're going too far. You need to be less, less principality oriented oriented toward the holiness of the whole community and the correct structure of, of society, you need to become like us. But when you're willing to do that and you're now putting yourself outside of the safe range, and this is where persecution begins, right? And now what's really interesting, we go into the next. So I have this signified as a, as a city, right? So you get the idea of that it's all these people and all the, it's all the organic relationships that you have, all those who live next door to you, all the things that are just happen to be your schools, your jobs, etc., this is what they rep represent, and um, and to be a Christian, you need to go become perfect. Be a, in in citizenry, that means never break any laws. Be a perfect citizen. Work really hard. Be re contribute, but then go when you go towards God, you go too far, and people start to you start to it starts to rub people the wrong way. And then the archangels. Now archangels in this simile in this in this example represent um, represent chosen associations and ideological causes so you can see like with um, all of the archangels that are named whenever you name something you're associating it with a particular um, thing so for example Gab Gabriel is associated with the message of God coming to men right God, you know he gives messages you can see that in the in the in the, uh, the book of Luke he was the angel that brought the message Michael is an angel of warfare. So you see that they have different tasks before our heaven, and they, in a sense, then represent that task. Well, we, in our life, if you want to think of it this way, we join associations. For example, we join churches. We join causes. We fight for this cause, or we believe in this cause, or we, or we attend this group. You know, we do these things where we choose to be parts of these things. Or we, or we have families, which are not really the whole society, but we're choosing both people who are biologically related to us and also people we choose who are friends and bring them into a family type structure or maybe if we're in a monastery or we're in the priesthood our brother priest etc and so you form these ideological bonds these these belief bonds these chosen bonds with people and that's like the archangels and as you can see it's the same thing so we talked about how Jesus in his life right he had first the the state he had the Romans who were a part of the principalities or this wide um, I guess it's a social structure of the state, right? But then he had the Jews, right? He was a Jew. He could have been a Hindu. He could have been, he could have been um, one of the one of the whatever the outer the Hittites, the people on the outside, the the Samaritans, right? He could have been and he could have believed like them. He could have been, uh, he could have been full Roman. He could have just been all out Roman. They could have, they, he could have been a tax collector. He could have identified with the Romans, but no, he was a Jew, right? And this is his chosen. His chosen beliefs, and in this, this, this is his particular. But what you notice is the same thing happened here, right? He went and he became an exemplar. They call him 
they call him teacher, they call him rabbi, right? He's um, he's got followers coming all around him, but he goes too far for the community, right? So then the leaders in the community start going, wait, you're saying things that we don't want to hear. And so they turn against him, right? And so this is, again, that, that interesting thing where you have to be perfect and then you have to go too far. You have to go more because, because it's never enough to follow the crowd towards God because, because the crowd, as Jesus said, the devil is the prince of the world. So it's not going to be going, it's not going, to be going correct, in the correct direction um, enough. There will be enough that is jaded and broken in the public community of your churches and in your communities that you need to go a step beyond and you need to be a bellwether. You need to be leading. You need to be, um, you need to be acting in ways that rub that rub people the wrong way sometimes, and that's just the the fact of it. You have to do that in your life, and um, through doing that, then you will receive persecution. So Jesus was persecuted by the Romans because he, like with the principalities, he wasn't working with the organic community or just that natural social place he lived in. He was persecuted by the Jews because he wasn't working with the spiritual and chosen ideological authority under which he lived, right? And then finally, we're going to come to the angels. And uh, I know this is not, it doesn't look like an angel to most people thinking about it, but the idea here is this is really, when you get down right into the nitty-gritty, this is the individual man. This is yourself. The same thing applies. So, and in a sense, you think about the spiritual life, right? It starts really with the principalities. It starts with the states. It starts with obeying laws, being a good citizen. You know, this is kind of stage one. You know, men form into groups. They agree not to hurt each other. They might be they might be um, dastardly and bad people underneath the surface, but they're going to obey um, the laws, uh, and they're going to try to do that in order to keep themselves working well and not getting caught, etc. Working in groups gives you more strength, etc. So they will work with communities first, right? Then you will find that within communities, they're going to work with ideological bonds because those also make them stronger against the communities, right? So that, that's going to be the natural next step, right? So you're going to be a better citizen of the public sphere in an easier way than anything else. Like in our society, to um, believe like you might see TikTok videos or social media and the way they might, t the kind of morals and things that they teach, they're not the same as our church, you know? But yet, that would be the kind of the base level of being a moral person, would be this kind of moral acceptance of the outer culture, which isn't moral in the end. But that's the beginning of morality, right? That's the starting of morality where, like, I don't want to be a weirdo. I don't want to be wrong. So you go and you kind of confine, you kind of work with that culture. In the beginning, and then you'll start to work with ideological groups, things like churches, things like belief systems, political parties, things like this. And you start working with those, and that that's going to be your next level. That's going to be your next level of association. Um, and and again, just like with Jesus, um, with the Pharisees, you're going to go too far if you do it correctly, and you're going to be persecuted, and you're going to be you're going to rub people the wrong way just like you do in the large society. But now when you get to the angels, you're talking about, at this point, um, you're talking about the same thing as we just talked about, but being applied to the, to the self, to the person, to you yourself, right? And it's the exact same structure. So finally, in a sense, it's easiest to be a good citizen and to go beyond that and to kind of rub people the wrong way in, this, in the terms of the state. It's harder to be a good um, ideological person because it takes a little bit of investment, um, intention, learning, um, and and you don't have to do that. That's not you're not going to get in trouble if you don't join a political cause or you don't join a church, right? But when you start getting into other more minute ideological investments, it'll take a bit more work. But that's the next level, right? Now, finally, though, true morality requires a conversion of yourself, right? So then again, you're going to get to a level where it's you're going to live rightly for yourself in terms of health, right? You're going to live l rightly for yourself in terms of long life, in terms of good friendships, in terms of righteous living. You're going to be holy. So Jesus had the rich man who came to him and said, how can I be saved? And he said, um, keep all the commandments, you know? And he said, I've kept all these. And he said, then go and sell everything and come follow me, you know, or another place. Come take up your cross daily and follow me. Or unless you take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of me, right? And these things now go and show you the same thing as we saw in these other two spheres, right? You've got to go too far. You've got to go beyond what seems like it's good for you 
to what seems like it's a little bad for you because it's good for God, right? And that 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 kind of like uncanny over the edge is required in all three spheres of life. 